Chapter Twelve of the Permanent Husband by Fyodor Dostoevsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Zaklebnikovs were certainly, as Velchaninoff had expressed it, a most respectable family. Zaklebnikov himself was a most eminently dignified and solid gentleman to look at. What Pavel Pavlovitch had said as to their resources was, however, quite true. They lived well, but if Pater Familias was to die, it would be very awkward for the rest. Old Zaklebnikov received Velchaninoff most cordially. He was no longer the legal opponent. He appeared now in a far more agreeable guise. "'I congratulate you,' he said at once, "'upon the issue. I did my best to arrange it so, and your lawyer was a capital fellow to deal with. You have your sixty thousand without trouble or worry, you see, and if we hadn't squared it we might have fought on for two or three years.' Velchaninoff was introduced to the lady of the house as well, an elderly, simple-looking, worn woman, then the girls began to troop in, one by one, and occasionally two together. But, somehow, there seemed to be even more than Velchaninoff had been led to expect. Ten or a dozen were collected already. He could not count them exactly. It turned out that some were friends from the neighbouring houses. The Zaklebnikov's country house was a large wooden structure of no particular style of architecture, but handsome enough and was possessed of a fine large garden. There were, however, two or three other houses built round the latter, so that the garden was common property for all, which fact resulted in great intimacy between the Zaklebnikov girls and the young ladies of the neighbouring houses. Velchaninoff discovered, almost from the first moment, that his arrival, in the capacity of Pavel Pavlovitch's friend, desiring an introduction to the family, was expected and looked forward to as a solemn and important occasion. Being an expert in such matters, he very soon observed that there was even more than this in his reception. Judging from the extra politeness of the parents, and by the exceeding smartness of the young ladies, he could not help suspecting that Pavel Pavlovitch had been improving the occasion, and that he had, not, of course, in so many words, given to understand that Velchaninoff was a single man, dull and disconsolate, and had represented him as likely enough at any moment to change his manner of living and set up an establishment, especially as he had just come in for a considerable inheritance. He thought that Katerina Fedosievna, the eldest girl, twenty-four years of age, and a splendid girl, according to Pavel's description, seemed rather got up to kill from the look of her. She was eminent, even among her well-dressed sisters, for special elegance of costume, and for a certain originality about the make-up of her abundant hair. The rest of the girls all looked as though they were well aware that Velchaninoff was making acquaintance with the family for Katie, and had come down to have a look at her. Their looks and words all strengthened the impression that they were acting with this supposition in view, as the day went on. Katerina Fedosievna was a fine, tall girl, rather plump, and with an extremely pleasing face. She seemed to be of a quiet, if not actually sleepy, disposition. Strange that such a fine girl should be unmarried, thought Velchaninoff, as he watched her with much satisfaction. All the sisters were nice-looking, and there were several pretty faces among the friends assembled. Velchaninoff was much diverted by the presence of all these young ladies. Nadezhda Fedosievna, the schoolgirl and bride-elect of Pavel Pavlovitch, had not as yet condescended to appear. Velchaninoff awaited her coming with a degree of impatience, which surprised and amused him. At last she came, and came with effect, too, accompanied by a lively girl, her friend, Maria Nikitishna, who was considerably older than herself, and a very old friend of the family, having been governess in a neighbouring house for some years. She was quite one of the family, and boasted of about twenty-three years of age. She was much esteemed by all the girls, and evidently acted at present as guide, philosopher, and friend to Nadia Nadezhda. Velchaninoff saw at the first glance that all the girls were against Pavel Pavlovitch, friends and all and when Nadia came in it did not take him long to discover that she absolutely hated him. 
he observed further that pavel pavlovitch either did not or would not notice this fact nadya was the prettiest of all the girls a little brunette with an impudent audacious expression she might have been a nihilist from the independence of her look the sly little creature had a pair of flashing eyes and a most charming smile though as often as not her smile was more full of mischief and wickedness than of amiability her lips and teeth were wonders she was slender but well put together and the expression of her face was thoughtful though at the same time childish fifteen years old was imprinted in every feature of her face and every motion of her body it appeared afterwards that pavel pavlovitch had actually seen the girl for the first time with a little satchel in her hand coming back from school she had ceased to carry the satchel since that day the present brought down by pavel pavlovitch proved a failure and was the cause of a very painful impression pavel pavlovitch no sooner saw his bride-elect enter the room than he approached her with a broad grin on his face he gave his present with the preface that he offered it in recognition of the agreeable sensation experienced by him at his last visit upon the occasion of nadezhda fedoshevna singing a certain song to the pianoforte and there he stopped in confusion and stood before her lost and miserable shoving the jeweller's box into her hand nadya however would not take the present and drew her hands away she approached her mother imperiously the latter looked much put out and said aloud i won't take it mother nadya was blushing with shame and anger take it and say thank you to pavel pavlovitch for it said her father quietly but firmly he was very far from pleased quite unnecessary quite unnecessary he muttered to pavel pavlovitch nadya seeing there was nothing else to be done took the case and curtsied just as children do giving a little bob down and then a bob up again as if she had been on springs one of the sisters came across to look at the present whereupon nadya handed it over to her unopened thereby showing that she did not care so much as to look at it herself the bracelet was taken out and handed around from one to the other of the company but all examined it silently and some even ironically only the mother of the family muttered that the bracelet was very pretty pavel pavlovitch would have been delighted to see the earth open and swallow him up velchaninoff helped the wretched man out of the mess he suddenly began to talk loudly and eloquently about the first thing that struck him and before five minutes had passed he had won the attention of every one in the room he was a wonderfully clever society talker he had the knack of putting on an air of absolute sincerity and of impressing his hearers with the belief that he considered them equally sincere he was able to act the simple careless and happy young fellow to perfection he was a master of the art of interlarding his talk with occasional flashes of real wit apparently spontaneous but actually prearranged and very likely stale in so far as he had himself made the joke before but to-day he was particularly successful he felt that he must talk on and talk well and he knew that before many moments were passed he should succeed in monopolizing all eyes and all ears that no joke should be laughed at but his own and no voice heard but his and sure enough the spell of his presence seemed to produce a wonderful effect in a while the talking and laughter became general with velchaninoff as the centre and motor of all mrs zaklebnikoff's kind face lighted up with real pleasure and katie's pretty eyes were alight with absolute fascination while her whole visage glowed with delight only nadya frowned at him and watched him keenly from beneath her dark lashes it was clear that she was prejudiced against him this last fact only roused velchaninoff to greater exertions the mischievous maria nikitishna however as nadya's ally succeeded in playing off a successful piece of chaff against velchaninoff she pretended that pavel pavlovitch had represented velchaninoff as the friend of his childhood thereby making the latter out to be some seven or eight years older than he really was velchaninoff liked the look of maria notwithstanding pavel pavlovitch was the picture of perplexity 
he quite understood the success which his friend was achieving and at first he felt glad and proud of that success laughing at the jokes and taking a share of the conversation but for some reason or other he gradually relapsed into thoughtfulness and thence into melancholy which fact was sufficiently plain from the expression of his lugubrious and careworn physiognomy well my dear fellow you are the sort of guest one need not exert oneself to entertain said old zaklebnikov at last rising and making for his private study where he had business of importance awaiting his attention and i was led to believe that you were the most morose of hypochondriacs dear me what mistakes one does make about other people to be sure there was a grand piano in the room and velchaninoff suddenly turned to nadya and remarked you sing don't you who told you i did said nadya curtly pavel pavlovitch it isn't true i only sing for a joke i have no voice oh but i have no voice either and yet i sing well you sing to us first and then i'll sing said nadya with sparkling eyes not now though after dinner i hate music she added i'm so sick of the piano we have singing and strumming going on all day here and katie is the only one of us all worth hearing Velchaninoff immediately attacked Katie, and besieged her with petitions to play. This attention from him to her eldest daughter so pleased Mamma that she flushed up with satisfaction. Katie went to the piano, blushing like a schoolgirl, and evidently much ashamed of herself for blushing. She played some little piece of Haydn's, correctly enough, but without much expression. When she had finished, Velchaninoff praised the music warmly, Haydn's music generally, and this little piece in particular. He looked at Katie, too, with admiration, and his expression seemed to say, By Jove, you're a fine girl! So eloquent was his look that every one in the room was able to read it, and especially Katie herself. What a pretty garden you have! said Velchaninoff after a short pause, looking through the glass doors of the balcony. Let's all go out, may we? Oh, yes! do let's go out cried several voices together he seemed to have hit upon the very thing most desired by all so they all adjourned into the garden and walked about there until dinner-time and velchaninoff had the opportunity of making closer acquaintance with some of the girls of the establishment two or three young fellows dropped in from the neighbouring houses a student a schoolboy and another young fellow of about twenty in a pair of huge spectacles each of these young fellows immediately attached himself to the particular young lady of his choice the young man in spectacles no sooner arrived than he went aside with nadia and maria nikitishna and entered into an animated whispering conversation with them with much frowning and impatience of manner this gentleman seemed to consider it his mission to treat pavel pavlovitch with the most ineffable contempt some of the girls proposed a game one of them suggested proverbs but it was voted dull another suggested acting but the objection was made that they never knew how to finish off it may be more successful with you said nadya to velchaninoff confidentially you know we all thought you were pavel pavlovitch's friend but it appears that he was only boasting i am very glad you have come for a certain reason she added looking knowingly into velchaninoff's face and then retreating back again to maria's wing blushing we'll play proverbs in the evening said another and we'll all chaff pavel pavlovitch you must help us too we are so glad you're come it's so dull here as a rule said a third a funny-looking red-haired girl whose face was comically hot with running apparently goodness knows where she had dropped from velchaninoff had not observed her arrive pavel pavlovitch's agitation increased every moment meanwhile velchaninoff took the opportunity of making great friends with nadya she had ceased to frown at him as before and had now developed the wildest of spirits dancing and jumping about singing and whistling and occasionally even catching hold of his hand in her innocent friendliness she was very happy indeed apparently but she took no more notice of pavel pavlovitch 
than if he had not been there at all. Pavel Pavlovitch was very jealous of all this, and once or twice, when Nadia and Velchaninoff talked apart, he joined them and rudely interrupted their conversation by interposing his anxious face between them. Katya could not help being fully aware by this time that their charming guest had not come in for her sake, as had been believed by the family. Indeed, it was clear that Nadia interested him so much that she excluded everyone else, to a considerable extent, from his attention. However, in spite of this, her good-natured face retained its amiability of expression all the same. She seemed to be happy enough witnessing the happiness of the rest and listening to the merry talk. She could not take a large share in the conversation herself, poor girl. "'What a fine girl your sister, Katerina Fedosievna, is,' remarked Velchaninoff to Nadia. "'Katya? I should think so. There is no better girl in the world. She's our family angel. I'm in love with her myself,' replied Nadia enthusiastically. At last dinner was announced, and a very good dinner it was, several courses being added for the benefit of the guests. A bottle of Taki made its appearance and champagne was handed round in honour of the occasion. The good humour of the company was general. Old Zaklebnikov was in high spirits, having partaken of an extra glass of wine this evening. So infectious was the hilarity that even Pavel Pavlovitch took heart of grace and made a pun. From the end of the table, where he sat beside the lady of the house, there suddenly came a loud laugh from the delighted girls, who had been fortunate enough to hear the virgin attempt. "'Papa! Papa! Pavel Pavlovitch has made a joke!' cried several at once. "'He says that there is quite a galaxy of gals here.' "'Oh, ho! He's made a pun, too, has he?' cried the old fellow. "'Well, what is it? Let's have it!' He turned to Pavel Pavlovitch with beaming face, prepared to roar over the latter's joke. "'Why, I tell you, he says there's quite a galaxy of gals.' "'Well, go on. Where's the joke?' repeated Papa, still dense to the merits of the pun, but beaming more and more with benevolent desire to see it. "'Oh, Papa, how stupid you are not to see it! Why, gals and galaxy, don't you see? He says there's quite a galaxy of gals.' "'Oh, ho, ho, ho guffawed the old gentleman. "'Ha, ha! Well, we'll hope he'll make a better one next time, that's all. Pavel Pavlovitch can't acquire all the perfections at once, said Maria Nikitishna. Oh, my goodness, he's swallowed a bone, look, she added, jumping up from her chair. The alarm was general, and Maria's delight was great. Poor Pavel Pavlovitch had only choked over a glass of wine, which he seized and drank to hide his confusion but Maria declared that it was a fish-bone, that she had seen it herself, and that people had been known to die of swallowing a bone just like that. "'Clap him on the back!' cried somebody. It appeared that there were numerous kind friends ready to perform this friendly office, and poor Pavel protested in vain that it was nothing but a common choke. The belabouring went on until the coughing fit was over, and it became evident that mischievous Maria was at the bottom of it all. After dinner, old Mr. Zaklebnikov retired for his postprandial nap, bidding the young people enjoy themselves in the garden as best they might. "'You enjoy yourself, too,' he added to Pavel Pavlovitch, tapping the latter's shoulder affably as he went by. When the party were all collected in the garden once more, Pavel suddenly approached Velchaninoff. "'One moment,' he whispered, pulling the latter by the coat-sleeve. The two men went aside into a lonely by-path. "'None of that here, please! I won't allow it here!' said Pavel Pavlovitch in a choking whisper. "'None of what? Who?' asked Velchaninoff, staring with all his eyes. Pavel Pavlovitch said nothing more, but gazed furiously at his companion, his lips trembling in a desperate attempt at a pretended smile. At this moment the voices of several of the girls broke in upon them, calling them to some game. Velchaninoff shrugged his shoulders and rejoined the party. Pavel followed him. "'I'm sure Pavel Pavlovitch was borrowing a handkerchief from you, wasn't he? He forgot his handkerchief last time, too. 
Pavel Pavlovitch has forgotten his handkerchief again, and he has a cold as usual," cried Maria. "'Oh, Pavel Pavlovitch, why didn't you say so?' cried Mrs. Zaklebnikov, making towards the house. "'You shall have one at once.' In vain poor Pavel protested that he had two of those necessary articles, and was not suffering from a cold. Mrs. Zaklebnikov was glad of the excuse for retiring to the house, and heard nothing. A few moments afterwards a maid pursued Pavel with a handkerchief, to the confusion of the latter gentleman. A game of proverbs was now proposed. All sat down, and the young man with spectacles was made to retire to a considerable distance and wait there with his nose close up against the wall, and his back turned until the proverb should have been chosen and the words arranged. Velchaninoff was the next in turn to be the questioner. Then the cry arose for Pavel Pavlovitch, and the latter, who had more or less recovered his good humour by this time, proceeded to the spot indicated, and, resolved to do his duty like a man, took his stand with his nose to the wall, ready to stay there motionless until called. The red-haired young lady was detailed to watch him, in case of fraud on his part. No sooner, however, had the wretched Pavel taken up his position at the wall, then the whole party took to their heels and ran away as fast as their legs could carry them. "'Run, quick!' whispered the girls to Velchaninoff, in despair, for he had not started with them. "'Why, what's happened? What's the matter?' asked the latter, keeping up as best he could. "'Don't make a noise. We want to get away and let him go on standing there, that's all.' Katya, it appeared, did not like this practical joke. When the last stragglers of the party arrived at the end of the garden, among them Velchaninoff, the latter found Katya angrily scolding the rest of the girls. "'Very well,' she was saying, "'I won't tell mother this time. But I shall go away myself. It's too bad. What will the poor fellow's feelings be, standing all alone there and finding us fled?' And off she went. The rest, however, were entirely unsympathising, and enjoyed the joke thoroughly. Velchaninoff was entreated to appear entirely unconscious when Pavel Pavlovitch should appear again, just as though nothing whatever had happened. It was a full quarter of an hour before Pavel put in an appearance, two-thirds at least, of that time he must have stood at the wall. When he reached the party he found everyone busy over a game of Gorielki, laughing and shouting and making themselves thoroughly happy. Wild with rage, Pavel Pavlovitch again made straight for Velchaninoff, and tugged him by the coat-sleeve. "'One moment, sir!' "'Oh, my goodness! He's always coming in with his one moments,' said someone. "'A handkerchief wanted again, probably,' shouted someone else after the pair as they retired. "'Come now, this time it was you. You were the originator of this insult,' muttered Pavel, his teeth chattering with fury. Velchaninoff interrupted him, and strongly recommended Pavel to bestir himself to be merrier. "'You are chaffed because you get angry,' he said. "'If you try to be jolly instead of sulky, you'll be let alone.' To his surprise these words impressed Pavel deeply. He was quiet at once, and returned to the party with a guilty air, and immediately began to take part in the games engaged in once more. He was not further bullied at present, and within half an hour his good humour seemed quite re-established. To Velchaninoff's astonishment, however, he never seemed to presume to speak to Nadia, although he kept as close to her on all occasions as he possibly could. He seemed to take his position as quite natural, and was not put out by her contemptuous air towards him. Pavel Pavlovitch was teased once more, however, before the evening ended. A game of hide-and-seek was commenced, and Pavel had hidden in a small room in the house. Being observed entering there by someone, he was locked in, and left there raging for an hour. Meanwhile Velchaninoff learned the special reason for Nadia's joy at his arrival. Maria conducted him to a lonely alley, where Nadia was awaiting him alone. "'I've quite convinced myself,' began the latter, when they were left alone that you are not nearly so great a friend of Pavel Pavlovitch as he gave us to understand. I have also convinced myself that you alone can perform a certain great service for me. Here is his horrid bracelet. 
she drew the case out of her pocket i wish to ask you to be so kind as to return it to him i cannot do so myself because i am quite determined never to speak to him again in all my life you can tell him so from me and better add that he is not to worry me with any more of his nasty presence i'll let him know something else i have to say through other channels will you do this for me oh for goodness sake spare me cried velchaninoff almost wringing his hands how spare you cried poor nadya her artificial tone put on for the occasion had collapsed at once before this check and she was nearly crying velchaninoff burst out laughing i don't mean i should be delighted you know but the thing is i have my own accounts to settle with him i knew you weren't his friend and that he was lying i shall never marry him never you may rely on that i don't understand how he could dare at all events you really must give him back this horrid bracelet what am i to do if you don't i must have it given back to him this very day he'll catch it if he interferes with father about me at this moment the spectacled young gentleman issued from the shrubs at their elbow you are bound to return the bracelet he burst out furiously upon velchaninoff if only out of respect to the rights of woman he did not finish the sentence for nadya pulled him away from beside velchaninoff with all her strength how stupid you are she cried go away how dare you listen i told you to stand a long way off she stamped her foot with rage and for some while after the young fellow had slunk away she continued to walk along with flashing eyes furious with indignation you won't believe how stupid he is she cried at last you laugh but think of my feelings that's not he is it laughed velchaninoff of course not how could you imagine such a thing it's only his friend and how he can choose such friends i can't understand they say he is a future motive power but i don't see it alexey ivanovitch for the last time i have no one else to ask will you give the bracelet back or not very well i will give it to me oh you dear good alexey ivanovitch thanks she cried enthusiastic with delight i'll sing all the evening for that i sing beautifully you know i was telling you a wicked story before dinner oh i wish you would come down here again i'd tell you all then and lots of other things besides for you are a dear kind good fellow like like katya and sure enough when they reached home she sat down and sang a couple of songs in a voice which though entirely untrained was of great natural sweetness and considerable strength when the party returned from the garden they had found pavel pavlovitch drinking tea with the old folks on the balcony he had probably been talking on serious topics as he was to take his departure the day after to-morrow for nine months he never so much as glanced at velchaninoff and the rest when they entered but he evidently had not complained to the authorities and all was quiet as yet but when nadya began to sing he came in nadya did not answer a single one of his questions but he did not seem offended by this and took his stand behind her chair once there his whole appearance gave it to be understood that that was his own place by right and that he allowed none to dispute it it's alexey ivanovitch's turn to sing now cried the girls when nadya's song was finished and all crowded round to hear velchaninoff who sat down to accompany himself he chose a song of Glinka's, too much neglected nowadays. It ran, When from your merry lips tenderness flows, etc. Velchaninoff seemed to address the words to Nadya exclusively, but the whole party stood around him. His voice had long since gone the way of all flesh, but it was clear that he must have had a good one once, and it so happened that Velchaninoff had heard this particular song many years ago from glinka's own lips when a student at the university and remembered the great effect that it had made upon him when he first heard it the song was full of the most intense passion of expression and velchaninoff sang it well with his eyes fixed upon nadya amid the applause that followed the completion of the performance 
Pavel Pavlovitch came forward, seized Nadya's hand, and drew her away from the proximity of Velchaninoff. He then returned to the latter at the piano, and, with every evidence of frantic rage, whispered to him, his lips all of a tremble, "'One moment with you!' Velchaninoff, seeing that the man was capable of worse things in his then frame of mind, took Pavel's hand and led him out through the balcony into the garden, quite dark now. "'Do you understand, sir, that you must come away at once, this very minute?' said Pavel Pavlovitch. "'No, sir, I do not.' "'Do you remember?' continued Pavel in his frenzied whisper. "'Do you remember that you begged me to tell you all, everything, down to the smallest details? Well, the time has come for telling you all. Come!' Velchaninoff considered a moment, glanced once more at Pavel Pavlovitch, and consented to go. "'Oh, stay and have another cup of tea!' said Mrs. Zaklebnikov, when this decision was announced. "'Pavel Pavlovitch, why are you taking Alexey Ivanovitch away?' cried the girls, with angry looks. As for Nadia, she looked so cross with Pavel that the latter felt absolutely uncomfortable, but he did not give in. "'Oh, but I am very much obliged to Pavel Pavlovitch,' said Velchaninoff, "'for reminding me of some most important business which I must attend to this very evening, and which I might have forgotten,' laughed Velchaninoff, as he shook hands with his host and made his bow to the ladies, especially to Katya, as the family thought. "'You must come again soon,' said the host. "'We have been so glad to see you. It was so good of you to come.' "'Yes, so glad,' said the lady of the house. "'Do come again soon,' cried the girls, as Pavel Pavlovitch and Velchaninoff took their seats in the carriage. "'Alexey Ivanovitch, do come back soon!' And with these voices in their ears, they drove away. End of chapter 12「Thirteen of the Permanent Husband » by Fyodor Dostoevsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In spite of Velchaninoff's apparently happy day, the feeling of annoyance and suffering at his heart had hardly actually left him for a single moment. Before he sang the song he had not known what to do with himself, or suppressed anger and melancholy, perhaps that was the reason why he had sung with so much feeling and passion. To think that I could so have lowered myself as to forget everything, he thought, and then despised himself for thinking it. It is more humiliating still to cry over what is done, he continued, far better to fly into a passion with someone instead. Fool, he muttered, looking askance at Pavel Pavlovitch, who sat beside him as still as a mouse. Pavel Pavlovitch preserved a most obstinate silence probably concentrating and ranging his energies. He occasionally took his hat off, impatiently, and wiped the perspiration from his forehead. Once, and once only, Pavel spoke. To the coachman, he asked whether there was going to be a thunderstorm. "'Phew!' said the man. "'I should think so. It's been a steamy day. Just the day for it.' By the time town was reached, half-past ten, the whole sky was overcast. "'I am coming to your house,' said Pavel to Velchaninoff, when almost at the door. "'Quite so, but I warn you, I feel very unwell to-night. "'All right, I won't stay too long.' When the two men passed under the gateway, Pavel Pavlovitch disappeared into the Dvornik's room for a minute to speak to Mavra. "'What did you go in there for?' asked Velchaninoff severely as they mounted the stairs and reached his own door. "'Oh, nothing, nothing at all, just to tell them about the coachman.' "'Very well. Mind, I shall not allow you to drink.' Pavel Pavlovitch did not answer. Velchaninoff lit a candle, while Pavel threw himself into a chair. Then the former came and stood menacingly before him. "'I may have told you I should have my last word to say to-night, as well as you.' he said with suppressed anger in his voice and manner. Here it is. 
I consider conscientiously that things are square between you and me now, and therefore there is no more to be said, understand me, about anything. Since this is so, had you not better go, and let me close the door after you? Let's cry quits first, Alexey Ivanovitch said Pavel Pavlovitch, gazing into Velchaninoff's eyes with great sweetness. "'Quits?' cried the latter in amazement. "'You strange man! What are we to cry quits about? Are you harping upon your promise of a last word?' "'Yes.' "'Oh, well, we have nothing more to cry quits for. We have been quits long since,' said Velchaninoff. "'Dear me! Do you really think so?' cried Pavel Pavlovitch, in a shrill, sharp voice, pressing his two hands tightly together, finger to finger, as he held them up before his breast. Velchaninoff said nothing. He rose from his seat and began to walk up and down the room. The word Liza resounded through and through his soul like the voice of a bell. "'Well, what is there that you still consider unsettled between us?' he asked at last looking angrily at Pavel, who had never ceased to follow him with his eyes, always holding his hands before his breast, fingertip to fingertip. "'Don't go down there any more,' said Pavel, almost in a whisper, and rising from his seat with every indication of humble entreaty. "'What? Is that all?' cried Velchaninoff, bursting into an angry laugh. "'Good heavens, man! You have done nothing but surprise me all day.' He had begun in a tone of exasperation, but he now abruptly changed both voice and expression, and continued with an air of deep feeling. Listen, he said, listen to me. I don't think I have ever felt so deeply humiliated as I am feeling now, in consequence of the events of today. In the first place, that I should have condescended to go down with you at all, and in the second place, all that happened there. It has been such a day of pettifogging, pitiful pettifogging. I have profaned and lowered myself by taking a share in it all, and forgetting... Well, it's done now. But look here. You fell upon me today, unawares, upon a sick man. Oh, you needn't excuse yourself. At all events, I shall certainly not go there again. I have not the slightest interest in so doing, he concluded with an air of decision. "'No, really!' cried Pavel Pavlovitch, making no secret of his delight and exultation. Velchaninoff glanced contemptuously at him, and recommenced his march up and down the room. "'You have determined to be happy under any circumstances, I suppose?' he observed, after a pause. He could not resist making the remark disdainfully. "'Yes, I have,' said Pavel quietly. It's no business of mine that he's a fool and a knave out of pure idiocy, thought Velchaninoff. I can't help hating him, though I feel that he is not even worth hating. I'm a permanent husband, said Pavel Pavlovitch, with the most exquisitely servile irony, at his own expense. I remember you using that expression, Alexey Ivanovitch, long ago, when you were with us at tea. I remember many of your original phrases of that time, and when you spoke of permanent husbands the other day, I recollected the expression." At this point Mavra entered the room with a bottle of champagne and two glasses. "'Forgive me, Alexey Ivanovitch,' said Pavel. "'You know I can't get on without it. Don't consider it an audacity on my part. Think of it as a mere bit of by-play, unworthy of your notice.' Well, consented Velchaninoff, with a look of disgust, but I must remind you that I don't feel well, and that— One little moment. I'll go at once. I really will. I must just drink one glass. My throat is so— He seized the bottle eagerly, and poured himself out a glass, drank it greedily at a gulp, and sat down. He looked at Velchaninoff almost tenderly. What a nasty-looking beast! muttered the latter to himself. It's all her friends that make her like that," said Pavel suddenly, with animation. "'What? Oh, you refer to the lady. I—' "'And besides, she is so very young still, you see,' resumed Pavel. "'I shall be her slave. She shall see a little society, and a bit of the world. She will change, sir, entirely.' 
I mustn't forget to give him back the bracelet, by the by, thought Velchaninoff, frowning, as he felt for the case in his coat pocket. "'You said just now that I am determined to be happy, Alexey Ivanovitch,' continued Pavel, confidentially and with almost touching earnestness. "'I must marry, else what will become of me? You see for yourself,' he pointed to the bottle. "'And that's only a hundredth part of what I demean myself to nowadays. I cannot get on without marrying again, sir. I must have a new faith. If I can but believe in some one again, sir, I shall rise, I shall be saved.' "'Why are you telling me all this?' exclaimed Velchaninoff, very nearly laughing in his face. It seemed so absurdly inconsistent. "'Look here,' he continued, roaring the words out. "'Let me know now, once for all, why did you drag me down there? What good was I to do you there?' "'I... I wish to try...' began Pavel, with some confusion. "'Try what?' "'The effect, sir. You see, Alexey Ivanovitch, I have only been visiting there a week,' he grew more and more confused. "'And yesterday, when I met you, I thought to myself that I had never seen her yet in society, that is, in the society of other men besides myself. A stupid idea, I know it is. I was very anxious to try. You know my wretchedly jealous nature.' He suddenly raised his head and blushed violently. "'He can't be telling me the truth,' thought Velchaninoff. He was struck dumb with surprise. "'Well, go on,' he muttered at last. "'Well, I see it was all her pretty childish nature, sir. That and her friends together. You must forgive my stupid conduct towards yourself to-day, Alexey Ivanovitch. I will never do it again, never again, sir, I assure you. I shall never be there to give you the opportunity," replied Velchaninoff with a laugh. "'That's partly why I say it,' said Pavel. "'Oh, come, I'm not the only man in the world, you know,' said the other irritably. "'I am sorry to hear you say that, Alexey Ivanovitch. My esteem for Nadejda is such that I—' "'Oh, forgive me, forgive me. I meant nothing, I assure you. Only it surprises me that you should have expected so much of me that you trusted me so completely. I trusted you entirely, sir, solely on account of all that has passed. So that you still consider me the most honourable of men? Velchaninoff paused. The naive nature of his sudden question surprised even himself. I always did think of you that, sir, said Pavel, hanging his head. Of course, quite so. I didn't mean quite that. I wanted to say, in spite of all prejudices you may have formed, you, yes, in spite of all prejudices. And when you first came to Petersburg, asked Velchaninoff, who himself felt the monstrosity of his own inquisitive questions, but could not resist putting them. I considered you the most honourable of men when I first came to Petersburg, sir, no less. I always respected you, Alexey Ivanovitch. Pavel Pavlovitch raised his eyes and looked at his companion without the smallest trace of confusion. Velchaninoff suddenly felt cowed and afraid. He was anxious that nothing should result, nothing disagreeable, from this conversation, since he himself was responsible for having initiated it. "'I loved you, Alexey Ivanovitch, all that year at tea. Loved you. You did not observe it,' continued Pavel Pavlovitch his voice trembling with emotion, to the great discomfiture of his companion. You did not observe my affection, because I was too lowly a being to deserve any sort of notice. But it was unnecessary that you should observe my love. Well, sir, and all these nine years I have thought of you, for I have never known such a year of life as that year was. Pavel's eyes seemed to have a special glare in them at this point. I remembered many of your sayings and expressions, sir, and I thought of you always as a man imbued with the loftiest sentiments, and gifted with knowledge and intellect, sir, of the highest order, a man of grand ideas. Great ideas do not proceed so frequently from greatness of intellect as from elevation of taste and feeling. You yourself said that, sir, once. I dare say you have forgotten the fact, but you did say it. Therefore I always thought of you, sir, as a man of taste and feeling, 
Consequently, I concluded. Consequently, I trusted you, in spite of everything. Pavel Pavlovitch's chin suddenly began to tremble. Velchaninoff was frightened out of his wits. This unexpected tone must be put an end to at all hazards. Enough, Pavel Pavlovitch, he said softly, blushing violently and with some show of irritation. And why, why, Velchaninoff suddenly began to shout passionately, why do you come hanging round the neck of a sick man, a worried man, a man who is almost out of his wits with fever and annoyance of all sorts, and drag him into this abyss of lies and mirage and vision and shame, and unnatural, disproportionate, distorted nonsense? Yes, sir, that's the most shameful part of the whole business, the disproportionate nonsense of what you say. You know it's all humbug. Both of us are mean wretches, both of us and if you like, I'll prove to you at once that not only you don't love me, but that you loathe and hate me with all your heart, and that you are a liar, whether you know it or not. You took me down to see your bride, not, not a bit in the world, to try to show how she would behave in the society of other men. Absurd idea! You simply saw me yesterday, and your vile impulse led you to carry me off there in order that you might show me the girl, and say, as it were, there, look at that. She's to be mine. Try your hand there, if you can. It was nothing but your challenge to me. You may not have known it, but this was so, as I say. And you felt the impulse which I have described. Such a challenge could not be made without hatred. Consequently, you hate me. Velchaninoff almost rushed up and down the room as he shouted these words and with every syllable the humiliating consciousness that he was allowing himself to descend to the level of Pavel Pavlovitch afflicted him and tormented him more and more. "'I was only anxious to be at peace with you, Alexey Ivanovitch,' said Pavel sadly, his chin and lips working again. Velchaninoff flew into a violent rage, as if he had been insulted in the most unexampled manner. "'I tell you once more, sir!' he cried, that you have attached yourself to a sick and irritated man, in order that you may surprise him into saying something unseemly in his madness. We are, I tell you, man, we are men of different worlds. Understand me. Between us two there is a grave. He hissed in his fury and stopped. And how do you know, sir? cried Pavel Pavlovitch, his face suddenly becoming all twisted, and deadly white to look at, as he strode up to Velchaninoff. "'How do you know what that grave means to me, sir, here?' He beat his breast with terrible earnestness, droll though he looked. "'Yes, sir, we both stand on the brink of the grave. But on my side there is more, sir, than on yours. More, more, more!' he hissed, beating his breast without pause. "'More than on yours. The grave means more to me than to you.' But at this moment a loud ring at the bell brought both men to their senses. Someone was ringing so loud that the bell-wire was in danger of snapping. "'People don't ring like that for me,' observed Velchaninoff angrily. "'No more they do for me, sir. I assure you they don't,' said Pavel Pavlovitch anxiously. He had become the quiet, timid Pavel again in a moment. Velchaninoff frowned and went to open the door. Mr. Velchaninoff, if I am not mistaken, said a strange voice, apparently belonging to some young and very self-satisfied person at the door. What is it? I have been informed that Mr. Trusotsky is at this moment in your rooms. I must see him at once. Velchaninoff felt inclined to send this self-satisfied-looking young gentleman flying downstairs again, but he reflected, refrained, stood aside and let him in. Here is Mr. Trusotsky. Come in. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Permanent Husband by Fyodor Dostoevsky This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A young fellow of some nineteen summers entered the room. He might have been even younger to judge by his handsome but self-satisfied and very juvenile face. 
He was not badly dressed, at all events his clothes fit him well. In stature he was a little above the middle height, he had thick black hair and dark, bold eyes, and these were the striking features of his face. Unfortunately his nose was a little too broad and tip-tilted, otherwise he would have been a really remarkably good-looking young fellow. He came in with some pretension. "'I believe I have the opportunity of speaking to Mr. Trusotsky? he observed deliberately, and bringing out the word opportunity with much apparent satisfaction, as though he wished to accentuate the fact that he could not possibly be supposed to feel either honour or pleasure in meeting Mr. Trusotsky. Velchaninoff thought he knew what all this meant. Pavel Pavlovitch seemed to have an inkling of the state of affairs, too. His expression was one of anxiety, but he did not show the white feather. "'Not having the honour of your acquaintance,' he said with dignity, "'I do not understand what sort of business you can have with me.' "'Kindly listen to me first, and you can then let me know your ideas on the subject,' observed the young gentleman, pulling out his tortoise-shell glasses, and focusing the champagne bottle with them. Having deliberately inspected that object, he put up his glasses again, and fixing his attention once more upon Pavel Pavlovitch, remarked, "'Alexander Lobov.' "'What about Alexander Lobov?' "'That's my name. You've not heard of me?' "'No.' "'Hm. Well, I don't know when you should have, now I think of it. But I've come on important business concerning yourself. I suppose I can sit down? I'm tired.' "'Oh, pray sit down,' said Velchaninoff, but not before the young man had taken a chair. In spite of the pain at his heart, Velchaninoff could not help being interested in this impudent youngling. There seemed to be something in his good-looking, fresh young face that reminded him of Nadia. "'You can sit down, too,' observed Lobov, indicating an empty seat to Pavel Pavlovitch, with a careless nod of his head. "'Thank you. I shall stand.' very well but you'll soon get tired you need not go away i think mr velchaninoff i have nowhere to go my good sir i am at home as you like i confess i should prefer your being present while i have an explanation with this gentleman nadezhda fedosievna has given you a flattering enough character sir to me nonsense how could she have had time to do so immediately after you left now, Mr. Trusotsky, this is what I wish to observe, he continued to Pavel, the latter still standing in front of him. We, that is, Nadezhda Fedosievna and myself, have long loved one another, and have plighted our troth. You have suddenly come between us as an obstruction. I have come to tell you that you had better clear out of the way at once. Are you prepared to adopt my suggestion? Pavel Pavlovitch took a step backward in amazement. His face paled visibly, but in a moment a spiteful smile curled his lip. "'Not in the slightest degree prepared, sir,' he said laconically. "'Dear me,' said the young fellow, settling himself comfortably in his chair, and throwing one leg over the other. "'Indeed, I do not know whom I am speaking to,' added Pavel Pavlovitch so that it can't hardly be worth your while to continue." So saying, he sat down at last. "'I said you'd get tired,' remarked the youth. "'I informed you just now,' he added, "'that my name is Alexander Lobov, and that Nadezhda and I have plighted our troth. Consequently you cannot truthfully say, as you did say just now, that you don't know who I am, nor can you honestly assert that you do not see what we can have to talk about not to speak of myself there is nadezhda fedosievna to be considered the lady to whom you have so impudently attached yourself that alone is matter sufficient for explanation between us all this the young fellow rattled off carelessly enough as if the thing were so self-evident that it hardly needed mentioning while talking he raised his eyeglass once more and inspected some object for an instant putting the glass back in his pocket immediately afterwards. "'Excuse me, young man,' began Pavel Pavlovitch, but the words, young man, were fatal. "'At another moment,' observed the youth, "'I should of course forbid your calling me young man at once. 
but you must admit that in this case my youth is my principal advantage over yourself and that even this very day you would have given anything nay at the moment when you presented your bracelet to be just a little bit younger cheeky young brat muttered velchaninoff in any case began pavel pavlovitch with dignity i do not consider your reasons as set forth most questionable and improper reasons at the best sufficient to justify the continuance of this conversation i see your business is mere childishness and nonsense to-morrow i shall have the pleasure of an explanation with mr zaklebnikoff my respected friend meanwhile sir perhaps you will make it convenient to depart that's the sort of man he is cried the youth hotly turning to velchaninoff he is not content with being as good as kicked out of the place and having faces made at him but he must go down again to-morrow to carry tales about us to mr zaklebnikoff do you not prove by this you obstinate man that you wish to carry off the young lady by force that you desire to buy her of people who preserve thanks to the relics of barbarism still triumphant among us a species of power over her surely she showed you sufficiently clearly that she despises you you have had your wretched tasteless present of to-day that bracelet thing returned to you what more do you want excuse me no bracelet has been or can be returned to me said pavel pavlovitch with a shudder of anxiety however how so hasn't mr velchaninoff given it to you oh the deuce take you sir thought velchaninoff nadezhda fedosievna certainly did give me this case for you pavel pavlovitch he said i did not wish to take it but she was anxious that i should here it is i'm very sorry he took out the case and laid it on the table before the enraged pavel pavlovitch how is it you have not handed it to him before asked the young man severely i had no time as you may conclude said velchaninoff with a frown hm strange circumstance what sir well you must admit it is strange however i am quite prepared to believe that there has been some mistake velchaninoff would have given worlds to get up and drub the impertinent young rascal and drag him out of the house by the ear but he could not contain himself and burst out laughing the boy immediately followed suit and laughed too but for pavel pavlovitch it was no laughing matter if velchaninoff had seen the ferocious look which the former cast at him at the moment when he and lobov laughed he would have realized that pavel pavlovitch was in the act of passing a fatal limit of forbearance he did not see the look but it struck him that it was only fair to stand up for pavel now listen mr lobov he said in friendly tones not to enter into the consideration of other matters i may point out that mr trusotsky brings with him in his wooing of miss zaklebnikoff a name and circumstances fully well known to that esteemed family in the second place he brings a fairly respectable position in the world and thirdly he brings wealth therefore he may well be surprised to find himself confronted by such a rival as yourself a gentleman of great wealth doubtless but at the same time so very young that he could not possibly look upon you as a serious rival therefore again he is quite right in begging you to bring the conversation to an end what do you mean by so very young i was nineteen a month since by the law i might have been married long ago that's a sufficient answer to your argument but what father would consent to allowing his daughter to marry you now even though you may be a rothschild to come or a benefactor to humanity in the future a man of nineteen years old is not capable of answering for himself and yet you are ready to take on your own responsibility another being in other words a being who is as much a child as you are yourself why it is hardly even honourable on your part is it i have presumed to address you thus because you yourself referred the matter to me as a sort of arbiter between yourself and pavel pavlovitch yes by the by pavel pavlovitch i forgot he was called that remarked the youth i wonder why i thought of him all along as vasily petrovitch look here sir 
addressing Velchaninoff, "'you have not surprised me in the least. I knew you were all tarred with one brush. It is strange that you should have been described to me as a man of some originality. However, to business. All that you have said is, of course, utter nonsense. Not only is there nothing dishonourable about my intentions, as you permitted yourself to suggest, but the fact of the matter is entirely the reverse, as I hope to prove to you by and by. In the first place, we have promised each other marriage, besides which I have given her my word that if she ever repents of her promise, she shall have her full liberty to throw me over. I have given her surety to that effect before witnesses. I bet anything your friend, what's his name, Predposilov, invented that idea, cried Velchaninoff. <laughs> giggled Pavel Pavlovitch contemptuously. What is that person giggling about? You are right, sir, it was Predposilov's idea. But I don't think you and I quite understand one another, do we? And I had such a good report of you. How old are you? Are you fifty yet? Stick to business, if you please. Forgive the liberty, I did not mean anything offensive. Well, to proceed, I am no millionaire, and I am no great benefactor to humanity, to reply to your arguments. But I shall manage to keep myself and my wife. Of course I have nothing now. I was brought up, in fact, in their house from my childhood. How so? Oh, because I am a distant relative of this Mr. Zaklebnikov's wife. When my people died, he took me in and sent me to school. The old fellow is really quite a kind-hearted man, if you only knew it. I do know it. Yes, he's an old fogey, rather, but a kind-hearted old fellow. But I left him four months ago, and began to keep myself. I first joined a railway office at ten roubles a month, and am now in a notary's place at twenty-five. I made him a formal proposal for her a fortnight since. He first laughed like mad, and afterwards fell into a violent rage, and Nadia was locked up. She bore it heroically. He had been furious with me before for throwing up a post in his department which he procured for me. You see he is a good and kind old fellow at home, but get him in his office and, oh my word, he's a sort of Jupiter Tonans. I told him straight out that I didn't like his ways, but the great row was thanks to the second chief at the office. He said I insulted him, but I only told him he was an ignorant beggar. So I threw them all up and went in for the notary business. Listen to that! What a clap! We shall have a thunderstorm directly. What a good thing I arrived before the rain! I came here on foot, you know, all the way, nearly at a run, too. How in the world did you find an opportunity of speaking to Miss Nadia, then? especially since you are not allowed to meet. Oh, one can always get over the railing. Then there's that red-haired girl, she helps, and Maria Nikitishna. Oh, but she's a snake, that girl. What's the matter? Are you afraid of the thunderstorm? No, I'm ill, seriously ill. Velchaninoff had risen from the seat with a fearful, sudden pain in his chest, and was trying to walk up and down the room. Oh, really? Then I'm disturbing you. I shall go at once, said the youth, jumping up. No, you don't disturb me, said Velchaninoff ceremoniously. How not? Of course I do, if you've got the stomach ache. Well now, Vasily, what's your name? Pavel Pavlovitch? Let's conclude this matter. I will formulate my question for once into words which will adapt themselves to your understanding. Are you prepared to renounce your claim to the hand of Nadezhda Fedosievna before her parents, and in my presence, with all due formality? No, sir, not in the slightest degree prepared, said Pavel Pavlovitch witheringly. And allow me to say once more that all this is childish and absurd, and that you had better clear out. Take care, said the youth, holding up a warning forefinger. Better give it up now, for I warn you that otherwise you will spend a lot of money down there, and take a lot of trouble, and when you come back in nine months you will be turned out of the house by Nadezhda Fedosievna herself, and if you don't go then it will be the worse for you. Excuse me for saying so, but at present you are like a dog in the manger. 
think over it and be sensible for once in your life spare me the moral if you please began pavel pavlovitch furiously and as for your low threats i shall take my measures to-morrow serious measures low threats pooh you are low yourself to take them as such very well i'll wait till to-morrow then but if you there's the thunder again au revoir very glad to have met you sir he nodded to velchaninoff and made off hurriedly evidently anxious to reach home before the rain End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of The Permanent Husband by Fyodor Dostoevsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. You see, you see, cried Pavel to Velchaninoff the instant that the young fellow's back was turned. Yes, you are not going to succeed there, said Velchaninoff. He would not have been so abrupt and careless of Pavel's feelings if it had not been for the dreadful pain in his chest. Pavel Pavlovitch shuddered as though from a sudden scald. "'Well, sir, and you—you you were loath to give me back the bracelet, eh?' "'I hadn't time. Oh, you were sorry? You pitied me, as true friend pities friend?' "'Oh, well, I pitied you then.' Velchaninoff was growing angrier every moment. However, he informed Pavel Pavlovitch shortly as to how he had received the bracelet, and how Nadia had almost forced it upon him. "'You must understand,' he added, "'that otherwise I should never have agreed to accept the commission. There are quite enough disagreeables already.' "'You liked the job and accepted it with pleasure,' giggled Pavel Pavlovitch. "'That is foolish on your part, but I suppose you must be forgiven. You must have seen from that boy's behaviour that I play no part in this matter. Others are the principal actors, not I. At all events the job had attractions for you. Pavel Pavlovitch sat down and poured out a glass of wine. You think I shall knuckle under to that young gentleman? Pooh! I shall drive him out to-morrow, sir, like dust. I'll smoke this little gentleman out of his nursery, sir. You see if I don't. He drank his wine off at a gulp, and poured out some more. He seemed to grow freer as the moments went by. He talked glibly now. Ha-ha! <laughs> Sachinka and Nadienka! Darling little children! Ha-ha-ha! <laughs> he was beside himself with fury. At this moment a terrific crash of thunder startled the silence, and was followed by flashes of lightning and sheets of heavy rain. Pavel Pavlovitch rose and shut the window. The fellow asked if you were afraid of the thunder. Do you remember? <laughs> Velchaninoff afraid of thunder. And all that about fifty years old wasn't bad, eh? <laughs> Pavel Pavlovitch was in a spiteful mood. You seem to have settled yourself here, said Velchaninoff, who could hardly speak for agony. Do as you like. I must lie down. Come, you wouldn't turn a dog out to-night, replied Pavel, glad of a grievance. "'Of course, sit down, drink your wine, do anything you like,' murmured Velchaninoff, as he laid himself flat on his divan, and groaned with pain. "'Am I to spend the night? Aren't you afraid?' "'What of?' asked Velchaninoff, raising his head slightly. "'Oh, nothing. Only last time you seemed to be a little alarmed, that's all.' "'You are a fool,' said the other angrily, as he turned his face to the wall. "'Very well, sir. All right,' said Pavel. Velchaninoff fell asleep within a minute or so of lying down. The unnatural strain of the day, and his sickly state of health together, had suddenly undermined his strength, and he was as weak as a child. But physical pain would have its own, and soon conquered weakness and sleep. In an hour he was wide awake again, and rose from the divan in anguish. Pavel Pavlovitch was asleep on the other sofa. He was dressed, and in his boots. His hat lay on the floor, and his eyeglass hung by its cord almost to the ground. Velchaninoff did not wake his guest. The room was full of tobacco smoke, and the bottle was empty. He looked savagely at the sleeping drunkard. Having twisted himself painfully off his bed, Velchaninoff began to walk about, groaning and thinking of his agony, 
He could lie no longer. He was alarmed for his pain in his chest, and not without reason. He was subject to these attacks, and had been so for many years. But they came seldom, luckily, once a year or two years. On such occasions his agony was so dreadful, for some ten hours or so, that he invariably believed that he might be actually dying. This night his anguish was terrible. It was too late to send for the doctor, but it was far from morning yet. He staggered up and down the room, and before long his groans became loud and frequent. The noise awoke Pavel Pavlovitch. He sat up on his divan, and for some time gazed in terror and perplexity upon Velchaninoff, as the latter walked moaning up and down. At last he gathered his senses, and inquired anxiously what was the matter. Velchaninoff muttered something unintelligible. "'It's your kidneys, I'm sure it is!' cried Pavel, very wide awake of a sudden. I remember Peter Kuzmich used to have the same sort of attacks, the kidneys. Why, one can die of it. Let me go and fetch Mavra. No, no, I don't want anything, muttered Velchaninoff, waving him off irritably. But Pavel Pavlovitch, goodness knows why, was beside himself with anxiety. He was as much exercised as though the matter at issue were the saving of his own son's life. He insisted on immediate compresses, and told Velchaninoff he must drink two or three cups of very hot, weak tea, boiling hot. He ran for Mavra, lighted the fire in the kitchen, put the kettle on, put the sick man back to bed, covered him up, and within twenty minutes had the first hot application all ready, as well as the tea. "'Hot plates, sir, hot plates!' he cried, as he clapped the first, wrapped in a napkin, on to Velchaninoff's chest. "'I have nothing else handy, but I give you my word, it's as good as anything else. Drink this tea quick, never mind if you scald your tongue, life is dearer. You can die of this sort of thing, you know.' He sent sleepy Mavra out of her wits with flurry. The plates were changed every couple of minutes. At the third application, and after having taken two cups of scalding tea, Velchaninoff suddenly felt decidedly better. "'Capital! Thank God! If we can once get the better of the pain, it's a good sign!' cried Pavel, delightedly, and away he ran for another plate and some more tea. "'If only we can beat the pain down!' he kept muttering to himself every minute. In half an hour the agony had passed, but the sick man was so completely knocked out that, in spite of Pavel's repeated entreaties to be allowed to apply just one more plate, he could bear no more. His eyes were drooping from weakness. "'Sleep, sleep!' he muttered faintly. "'Very well,' consented Pavel. "'Go to sleep.' "'Are you spending the night here? What time is it?' "'Nearly two. You must sleep here.' "'Yes, yes, all right, I will.' A moment after the sick man called to Pavel again. "'You, you,' muttered the former faintly, as Pavel ran up and bent over him. "'You are better than I am. I understand all, all. Thank you.' "'Go to sleep,' whispered Pavel Pavlovitch, as he crept back to his divan on tiptoes. Velchaninoff, dozing off, heard Pavel quietly make his bed, undress and lie down, all very softly, and then put the light out. Undoubtedly Velchaninoff fell asleep very quietly when the light was once out. He remembered that much afterwards. Yet all the while he was asleep, and until he awoke, he dreamed that he could not go to sleep in spite of his weakness. At length he dreamed that he was delirious, and that he could not for the life of him chase away the visions which crowded in upon him although he was conscious the whole while they were but visions and not reality. The apparition was familiar to him. He thought that his front door was open, and that his room gradually filled with people pouring in. At the table in the middle of the room sat one man exactly as had been the case a month before, during one of his dreams. As on the previous occasion, this man leant on his elbow at the table and would not speak. He was in a round hat with a crape band. How, thought the dreamer, was it really Pavel Pavlovitch last time as well? However, when he looked at the man's face, he was convinced that it was quite another person. 
Why has he a crape band, then? thought Velchaninoff, in perplexity. The noise and chattering of all these people was dreadful. They seemed even more exasperated with Velchaninoff than on the former occasion. They were all threatening him with something or other, shaking their fists at him, and shouting something which he could not understand. "'It's all a vision,' he dreamed. "'I know quite well that I am up and about, because I could not lie still for anguish.' Yet the cries and noise at times seemed so real that he was now and again half convinced of their reality. "'Surely this can't be delirium,' he thought. "'What on earth do all these people want of me? My God!' Yet if it were not a vision, surely all these cries would have roused Pavel Pavlovitch? There he was, fast asleep on his divan. Then something suddenly occurred as in the old dream. Another crowd of people surged in, crushing those who were already collected inside. These new arrivals carried something large and heavy. He could judge of the weight by their footsteps labouring upstairs. Those in the room cried, they're bringing it! They're bringing it! Every eye flashed as it turned and glared at Velchaninoff. Every hand threatened him and then pointed to the stairs. Undoubtedly it was reality, not delirium. Velchaninoff thought that he stood up and raised himself on tiptoes, in order to see over the heads of the crowd. He wanted to know what was being carried in. His heart beat wildly, wildly, wildly and suddenly, as in his former dream, there came one, two, three loud rings at the bell. And again the sound of the bell was so distinct and clear that he felt it could not be a dream. He gave a cry and awoke, but he did not rush to the door as on the former occasion. What sudden idea was it that guided his movements? Had he any idea at all, or was it impulse that prompted him what to do? He sprang up in bed, with arms outstretched, as though to ward off an attack, straight towards the divan where Pavel Pavlovitch was sleeping. His hands encountered other hands outstretched in his direction. Consequently, someone must have been standing over him. The curtains were drawn, but it was not absolutely dark, because a faint light came from the next room, which had no curtains. Suddenly something cut the palm of his left hand, some of his fingers causing him sharp pain. He instantly realized that he had seized a knife or a razor, and he had closed his hand upon it with the rapidity of thought. At that moment something fell to the ground with a hard metallic sound. Velchaninoff was probably three times as strong as Pavel Pavlovitch, but the struggle lasted for a long while, at least three minutes. The former, however, forced his adversary to the earth, and bent his arms back behind his head. Then he paused, for he was most anxious to tie the hands. Holding the assassin's wrists with his wounded left hand, he felt for the blind cord with his right. For a long while he could not find it. At last he grasped it, and tore it down. He was amazed afterwards at the unnatural strength which he must have displayed during all this. During the whole of the struggle neither man spoke a word. Only their heavy breathing was audible, and the inarticulate sounds emitted by both as they fought. At length, having secured his opponent's hands, Velchaninoff left him on the ground, rose, drew the curtains, and pulled up the blind. The deserted street was light now. He opened the window, and stood breathing in the fresh air for a few moments. It was a little past four o'clock. He shut the window once more, fetched a towel and bound up his cut hand as tightly as he could to stop the flow of blood. At his feet he caught sight of the opened razor lying on the carpet. He picked it up, wiped it, and put it by in its own case, which he now saw he had left upon the little cupboard beside the divan which Pavel Pavlovitch occupied. He locked the cupboard. Having completed all these arrangements, he approached Pavel Pavlovitch and looked at him. Meanwhile the latter had managed to raise himself from the floor and reached a chair. He was now sitting in it, undressed to his shirt, which was stained with marks of blood both back and front. Velchaninoff's blood, not his own. Of course this was Pavel Pavlovitch, but it would have been only natural for anyone who had known him before, and saw him at this moment, to doubt his identity. He sat upright in his chair, very stiffly, 
owing to the uncomfortable position of his tightly bound hands behind his back. His face looked yellow and crooked, and he shuddered every other moment. He gazed intently, but with an expression of dazed perplexity, at Velchaninoff. Suddenly he smiled gravely, and, nodding towards a carafe of water on the table, muttered, "'A little drop!' Velchaninoff poured some into a glass, and held it for him to drink. Pavel gulped a couple of mouthfuls greedily, then suddenly raised his head and gazed intently at Velchaninoff standing over him. He said nothing, however, but finished the water. He then sighed deeply. Velchaninoff took his pillows and some of his clothing, and went into the next room, locking Pavel Pavlovitch behind him. His pain had quite disappeared, but he felt very weak after the strain of his late exertion. Goodness knows whence came his strength for the trial. He tried to think, but he could not collect his ideas. The shock had been too great. His eyes would droop now and again, sometimes for ten minutes at a time. Then he would shudder, wake up, remember all that had passed, and raise the blood-stained rag bound about his hand to prove the reality of his thoughts. Then he would relapse into eager, feverish thought. One thing was certain. Pavel Pavlovitch had intended to cut his throat, though, perhaps, a quarter of an hour before the fatal moment he had not known that he would make the attempt. Perhaps he had seen the razor case last evening, and thought nothing of it, only remembering the fact that it was there. The razors were usually locked up, and only yesterday Velchaninoff had taken one out in order to make himself neat for his visit to the country, and had omitted to lock it up again. If he had premeditated murdering me, he would certainly have provided himself with a knife or a pistol long ago. He could not have relied on my razors, which he never saw until yesterday," concluded Velchaninoff. At last the clock struck six. Velchaninoff arose, dressed himself, and went into Pavel Pavlovitch's room. As he opened the door, he wondered why he had ever locked it, and why he had not allowed Pavel to go away at once. To his surprise, the prisoner was dressed. He had doubtless found means to get his hands loose. He was sitting in an armchair, but rose when Velchaninoff entered. His hat was in his hand. His anxious look seemed to say, as plain as words, "'Don't talk to me. It's no use talking. Don't talk to me.' "'Go,' said Velchaninoff. "'Take your jewel-case,' he added. Pavel Pavlovitch turned back and seized his bracelet-case, stuffing it into his pocket, and went out. Velchaninoff stood in the hall, waiting to shut the front door after him. Their looks met for the last time. Pavel Pavlovitch stopped, and the two men gazed into each other's eyes for five seconds or so, as though in indecision. At length Velchaninoff faintly waved him away with his hand. "'Go,' he said, only half aloud, as he closed the door and turned the key. End of chapter 15 Chapter Sixteen of the Permanent Husband by Fyodor Dostoevsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A feeling of immense happiness took possession of Velchaninoff. Something was finished and done with and settled. Some huge anxiety was at an end, so it seemed to him. This anxiety had lasted five weeks. He raised his hand and looked at the blood-stained rag bound about it. Oh, yes, he thought, it is, indeed, all over now. And all this morning, the first time for many a day, he did not even once think of Liza, just as if the blood from those cut fingers had wiped out that grief as well, and made him quits with it. He quite realized how terrible was the danger which he had passed through. For those people, he thought, who do not know a minute or two beforehand that they are going to murder you, when they once get the knife into their hands and feel the first touch of warm blood, good heaven! They not only cut your throat, they hack your head off afterwards, right off! Velchaninoff could not sit at home. He must go out and let something happen to him. And he walked about in hopes of something turning up. He longed to talk, and it struck him that he might fairly go to the doctor and talk to him, 
and have his hand properly bound up. The doctor inquired how he hurt his hand, which made Velchaninoff laugh like mad. He was on the point of telling all, but refrained. Several times during the day he was on the point of telling others the whole story. Once it was to a perfect stranger in a restaurant, with whom he had begun to converse on his own initiative. Before this day he had hated the very idea of speaking to strangers in the public restaurants. He went into a shop and ordered some new clothes, not with the idea of visiting the Pogoryeltseps, however. The thought of any such visit was distasteful to him. Besides, he could not leave town. He felt that he must stay and see what was going to happen. Velchaninoff dined and enjoyed his dinner, talked affably to his neighbour and to the waiter as well. When evening fell he went home. His head was whirling a little, and he felt slightly delirious. The first sight of his rooms gave him quite a start. He walked round them and reflected. He visited the kitchen, which he had hardly ever done before in his life, and thought, this is where they heated the plates last night. He locked the doors carefully, and lit his candles earlier than usual. As he shut the door, he remembered that he had asked Mavra, as he passed the Dvornik's lodging, whether Pavel Pavlovitch had been there, just as if the latter could possibly have been near the place. Having then carefully locked himself in, he opened the little cupboard where his razors were kept, and took out the razor. There was still some of the blood on the bone handle. He put the razor back again and locked the cupboard. He was sleepy. He felt that he must go to sleep as speedily as possible, otherwise he would be useless for to-morrow. And to-morrow seemed to him, for some reason or other, to be about to be a fateful day for him. But all those thoughts which had crowded in upon him all day, and had never left him for a moment, were still in full swing within his brain. He thought and thought and thought, and could not fall asleep. If Pavel Pavlovitch arrived at murdering point accidentally, had he ever seriously thought of murder even for a single evil instant before? Velchaninoff decided the question strangely enough. Pavel Pavlovitch had the desire to murder him, but did not himself know of the existence of this desire. It seemed an absurd conclusion. But so it is, thought Velchaninoff. Pavel Pavlovitch did not come to Petersburg to look out for a new appointment, nor did he come for the sake of finding Bagantov, in spite of his rage when the latter died. No, he despised Bagantov thoroughly. Pavel Pavlovitch had come to St. Petersburg for him, and had brought Liza with him, for him alone, Velchaninoff. Did I expect to have my throat cut? Velchaninoff decided that he had expected it, from the moment when he saw Pavel Pavlovitch in the carriage following Bagantov's funeral procession. That is, I expected something, of course, not exactly to have my throat cut. And surely, surely, it was not all bona fide yesterday, he reflected, raising his head from the pillow in the excitement of the idea. Surely it cannot have been all in good faith that that fellow assured me of his love for me, beating his breast, and with his underlip trembling as he spoke. Yes, it was absolutely bona fide, he decided. This Quasimodo of T was quite good enough and generous enough to fall in love with his wife's lover, his wife in whom he never observed anything during the twenty years of their married life. He respected and loved me for nine years, and remembered both me and my sayings. My goodness, to think of that! and I knew nothing whatever of all this. Oh, no, he was not lying yesterday, but did he love me while he declared his love for me, and said that we must be quits? Yes, he did, he loved me spitefully, and spiteful love is sometimes the strongest of all. I dare say I made a colossal impression upon him down at tea, for it is just upon such Schiller-like men that one is liable to make a colossal impression. He exaggerated my value a thousandfold. Perhaps it was my philosophical retirement that struck him. It would be curious to discover precisely what it was that made so great an impression upon him. Who knows, it may have been that I wore a good pair of gloves, and knew how to put them on. These Quasimodo fellows love aestheticism to distraction. 
give them a start in the direction of admiration for yourself and they will do all the rest and give you a thousand times more than your due of every virtue that exists will fight to the death for you with pleasure if you ask it of them how high he must have held my aptitude for illusioning others perhaps that has struck him as much as anything else for he remarked if this man deceived me who am i ever to trust again after such a cry as that a man may well turn wild beast and he came here to embrace and weep over me as he expressed it hm that means he came to cut my throat and thought that he came to embrace and weep over me he brought liza with him too what if i had wept with him and embraced him perhaps he really would have fully and entirely forgiven me for he was yearning to forgive me i could see that and all this turned to drunkenness and bestiality at the first check yes pavel pavlovitch the most deformed of all deformities is the abortion with noble feelings and this man was foolish enough to take me down to see his bride my goodness his bride only such a lunatic of a fellow could ever have developed so wild an idea as a new existence to be inaugurated by an alliance between himself and nadya but you are not to blame pavel pavlovitch you are a deformity and all your ideas and actions and aspirations must of necessity be deformed but deformity though he be why in the world was my sanction my blessing as it were necessary to his union with miss zaklebnikoff perhaps he sincerely hoped that there with so much sweet innocence and charm around us we should fall into each other's arms in some leafy spot and weep out our differences on each other's shoulders was murder in his thoughts when i caught him standing between our beds that first time in the darkness no i think not and yet the first idea of it may have entered his soul as he stood there and if i had not left the razors out probably nothing would have happened surely that is so for he avoided me for weeks he was sorry for me and avoided me he chose bagantov to expend his wrath upon first not me he jumped out of bed and fussed over the hot plates to divert his mind from murder perhaps from the knife to charity perhaps he tried to save both himself and me by his hot plates so mused velchaninoff his poor overwrought brain working on and on and jumping from conclusion to conclusion with the endless activity of fever until he fell asleep next morning he awoke with no less tired brain and body but with a new terror an unexpected and novel feeling of dread hanging over him this dread consisted in the fact that he felt that he velchaninoff must go and see pavel pavlovitch that very day he knew not why he must go but he felt drawn to go as though by some unseen force the idea was too loathsome to look into so he left it to take care of itself as an unalterable fact the madness of it however was modified and the whole aspect of the thought became more reasonable after a while when it took shape and resolved itself into a conviction in velchaninoff's mind that pavel pavlovitch had returned home locked himself up and hung himself to the bedpost as maria sisevna had described of the wretched suicide witnessed by poor liza why should the fool hang himself he repeated over and over again and yet the thought would return that he was bound to hang himself as liza had said that he threatened to do Velchaninoff could not help adding that if he were in Pavel Pavlovitch's place he would probably do the same. So the end of it was that instead of going out to his dinner he set off for Pavel Pavlovitch's lodging just to ask Maria Sisevna after him. But before he had reached the street he paused and his face flushed up with shame. Surely I am not going there to embrace and weep over him surely i am not going to add this one last pitiful folly to the long list of my late shameful actions however his good providence saved him from this pitiful folly for he had hardly passed through the large gateway into the street when alexander lobov suddenly collided with him the young fellow was dashing along in a state of great excitement 
I was just coming to you. Our friend Pavel Pavlovitch, a nice sort of fellow, he is. Has he hung himself? gasped Velchaninoff. Hung himself? Who? Why? asked Lobov, with his eyes starting out of his head. Oh, go on, I meant nothing. Phew! What a funny line your thoughts seem to take. He hasn't hung himself a bit. Why in the world should he? On the contrary, he's gone away. I've just seen him off. My goodness, how that fellow can drink! We had three bottles of wine. Predposilov was there, too. But how the fellow drinks! Good heavens! He was singing in the carriage when the train went off. He thought of you and kissed his hand to you and sent his love. He's a scamp, that fellow, eh? Young Lobov had apparently had quite his share of the three bottles. His face was flushed and his utterance thick. Velchaninoff roared with laughter. So you ended up by weeping over each other's shoulders, did you? Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, you poetical, shillerish, funny fellows, you! Don't scold us. You must know he went down there yesterday and today, and he has withdrawn. He sneaked, like anything about Nadia and me. They've shut her up. There was such a row. But we wouldn't give way. And, my word, how the fellow drinks! He was always talking about you. But, of course, he is no companion for you. You are, more or less, a respectable sort of man, and must have belonged to society at some time of your life, though you seem to have retired into private life just now. Is it poverty, or what? I couldn't make head or tail of Pavel Pavlovitch's story. Oh, then it was he who gave you those interesting details about me. Yes, don't be cross about it. It's better to be a citizen than a swell any day. The thing is, one does not know whom to respect in Russia nowadays. Don't you think it a diseased feature of the times, in Russia, that one doesn't know whom to respect? Quite so, quite so. Well, go on about Pavel Pavlovitch. Well, he sat down in the railway carriage and began singing. Then he cried a bit. It was really disgusting to see the fellow. I hate fools. Then he began to throw money to beggars. For the repose of Liza's soul, he said. Is that his wife? Daughter. What's the matter with your hand? I cut it. Hmm. Never mind. Cheer up. It'll be all right soon. I am glad that fellow has gone, you know. Confound him. But I bet anything he'll marry as soon as he arrives at his place. Well, what of that? You are going to marry, too. I? That's quite a different affair. What a funny man you are. Why, if you are fifty, he must be sixty. Well, ta-ta. Glad I met you. Can't come in. Don't ask me. No time. He started off at a run, but turned a minute after and came back. "'What a fool I am!' he cried. "'I forgot all about it. He sent you a letter. Here it is. How was it you didn't see him off? Ta-ta!' Velchaninoff returned home and opened the letter, which was sealed and addressed to himself. There was not a syllable inside in Pavel Pavlovitch's own handwriting but he drew out another letter, and knew the writing at once. It was an old, faded, yellow-looking sheet of paper, and the ink was faint and discoloured. The letter was addressed to Velchaninoff, and written ten years before, a couple of months after his departure from T. He had never received a copy of this one, but another letter, which he well remembered, had evidently been written and sent instead of it. He could tell that by the substance of the faded document in his hand. In this present letter Natalia Vasilievna bade farewell to him for ever, as she had done in the other communication, and informed him that she expected her confinement in a few months. She added, for his consolation, that she would find an opportunity of purveying his child to him in good time, and pointed out that their friendship was now cemented for ever. She begged him to love her no longer, because she could no longer return his love, but authorized him to pay a visit to T, after a year's absence, in order to see the child. Goodness only knows why she had not sent this letter, but had changed it for another. 
Belchaninov was deadly pale when he read this document, but he imagined Pavel Pavlovitch finding it in the family box of black wood with mother-of-pearl ornamentation and silver mounting, and reading it for the first time. "'I should think he, too, grew as pale as a corpse,' he reflected, catching sight of his own face in the looking-glass. Perhaps he read it and then closed his eyes, and hoped and prayed that when he opened them again the dreadful letter would be nothing but a sheet of white paper once more. Perhaps the poor fellow tried this desperate expedient two or three times before he accepted the truth. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of the Permanent Husband by Fyodor Dostoevsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Permanent Husband. Two years have elapsed since the events recorded in the foregoing chapters, and we find our friend Belchaninov, one lovely summer day, seated in a railway carriage on his way to Odessa. He was making the journey for the purpose of seeing a great friend and of being introduced to a lady whose acquaintance he had long wished to make. Without entering into any details, we may remark that Velchaninoff was entirely changed during these last two years. He was no longer the miserable, fanciful hypochondriac of those dark days. He had returned to society and to his friends, who gladly forgave him his temporary relapse into seclusion. Even those whom he had ceased to bow to when met were now among the first to extend the hand of friendship once more, and asked no questions, just as though he had been abroad on private business, which was no affair of theirs. His success in the legal matters of which we have heard, and the fact of having his sixty thousand roubles safe at his bankers, enough to keep him all his life, was the elixir which brought him back to health and spirits. His premature wrinkles departed, his eyes grew brighter, and his complexion better. He became more active and vigorous. In fact, as he sat thinking in a comfortable first-class carriage, he looked a very different man from the Belchaninov of two years ago. The next station to be reached was that at which passengers were expected to dine, forty minutes being allowed for this purpose. It so happened that Velchaninoff, while seated at the dinner-table, was able to do a service to a lady who was also dining there. This lady was young and nice-looking, though rather too flashily dressed, and was accompanied by a young officer who unfortunately was scarcely in a befitting condition for lady society, having refreshed himself at the bar to an unnecessary extent. This young man succeeded in quarrelling with another person equally unfit for lady society, and a brawl ensued, which threatened to land both parties upon the table in close proximity to the lady. Velchaninoff interfered, and removed the brawlers to a safe distance, to the great and almost boundless gratitude of the alarmed lady, who hailed him as her guardian angel. Velchaninoff was interested in the young woman, who looked like a respectable provincial lady, of provincial manners and taste, as her dress and gestures showed. A conversation was opened, and the lady immediately commenced to lament that her husband was never by when he was wanted, and that he had now gone and hidden himself somewhere just because he happened to be required. "'Poor fellow, he'll catch it for this,' thought Velchaninoff. "'If you will tell me your husband's name,' he added aloud, "'I will find him, with pleasure.' "'Pavel Pavlovitch,' hiccuped the young officer. "'Your husband's name is Pavel Pavlovitch, is it?' inquired Velchaninoff with curiosity, and at the same moment a familiar bald head was interposed between the lady and himself. "'Here you are at last!' cried the wife hysterically. It was, indeed, Pavel Pavlovitch. He gazed in amazement and dread at Velchaninoff, falling back before him just as though he saw a ghost. So great was his consternation that for some time it was clear that he did not understand a single word of what his wife was telling him, which was that Velchaninoff had acted as her guardian angel, and that he, Pavel, ought to be ashamed of himself for never being at hand when he was wanted. 
At last Pavel Pavlovitch shuddered and woke up to consciousness. Velchaninoff suddenly burst out laughing. "'Why, we are old friends!' he cried. "'Friends from childhood!' He clapped his hand familiarly and encouragingly on Pavel's shoulder. Pavel smiled wanly. "'Hasn't he ever spoken to you of Velchaninoff? "'No, never,' said the wife, a little confused. "'Then introduce me to your wife, you faithless friend.' "'This, this is Mr. Velchaninoff,' muttered Pavel Pavlovitch, looking the picture of confusion. All went swimmingly after this. Pavel Pavlovitch was dispatched to cater for the party, while his lady informed Velchaninoff that they were on their way from O, where Pavel Pavlovitch served, to their country place, a lovely house, she said, some twenty-five miles away. There they hoped to receive a party of friends, and if Mr. Velchaninoff would be so very kind as to take pity on their rustic home, and honour it with a visit, she should do her best to show her gratitude to the guardian angel who, etc., etc. Velchaninoff replied that he would be delighted, and that he was an idle man, and always free, adding a compliment or two which caused the fair lady to blush with delight and to tell Pavel Pavlovitch, who now returned from his quest, that Alexey Ivanovitch had been so kind as to promise to pay them a visit next week and stay a whole month. Pavel Pavlovitch, to the amazed wrath of his wife, smiled a sickly smile and said nothing. After dinner the party bade farewell to Velchaninoff and returned to their carriage, while the latter walked up and down the platform, smoking his cigar he knew that Pavel Pavlovitch would return to talk to him. So it turned out. Pavel came up with an expression of the most anxious and harassed misery. Velchaninoff smiled, took his arm, led him to a seat, and sat down beside him. He did not say anything, for he was anxious that Pavel should make the first move. "'So you are coming to us?' murmured the latter at last, plunging in medius race. "'I knew you'd begin like that. You haven't changed an atom!' cried Velchaninoff, roaring with laughter, and slapping him confidentially on the back. "'Surely you don't really suppose that I ever had the smallest intention of visiting you, and staying a month, too!' Pavel Pavlovitch gave a start. "'Then you're not coming?' he cried, without an attempt to hide his joy. "'No, no, of course not!' replied Velchaninoff, laughing. He did not know why, but all this was exquisitely droll to him, and the further it went, the funnier it seemed. "'Really? Are you really serious?' cried Pavel, jumping up. "'Yes, I tell you, I won't come. Not for the world.' "'But what will my wife say now? She thinks you intend to come.' "'Oh, tell her I've broken my leg, or anything you like.' "'She won't believe.' said Pavel, looking anxious. "'Ha! You'll catch it at home, I see. Tell me, who is that young officer?' "'Oh, a distant relative of mine, an unfortunate young fellow—' "'Pavel Pavlovitch!' cried a voice from the carriage. "'The second bell has rung!' Pavel was about to move off. Velchaninoff stopped him. "'Shall I go and tell your wife how you tried to cut my throat?' he said. "'What are you thinking of? God forbid!' cried Pavel in a terrible fright. "'Well, go along, then,' said the other, loosening his hold of Pavel's shoulder. "'Then, then, you won't come, will you?' said Pavel once more, timidly and despairingly, and clasping his hands in entreaty. "'No, I won't. I swear. Run away. You'll be late.' He put out his hand mechanically, then recollected himself, and shuddered. Pavel did not take the proffered hand. He withdrew his own. The third bell rang. An instantaneous but total change seemed to have come over both. Something snapped within Velchaninoff's heart, so it seemed to him, and he who had been roaring with laughter a moment before seized Pavel Pavlovitch angrily by the shoulder. "'If I—I I offer you my hand, sir,' he showed the scar on the palm of his left hand, "'if I can offer you my hand, sir, 
I should think you might accept it, he hissed with white and trembling lips. Pavel Pavlovitch grew deadly white also. His lips quivered and a convulsion seemed to run through his features. And Liza? he whispered quickly. Suddenly his whole face worked and tears started to his eyes. Velchaninoff stood like a log before him. Pavel Pavlovitch! Pavel Pavlovitch! shrieked the voice from the carriage in despairing accents, as though someone were being murdered. Pavel roused himself and started to run. At that moment the engine whistled, and the train moved off. Pavel Pavlovitch just managed to cling on, and so climb into his carriage as it moved out of the station. Velchaninoff waited for another train, and then continued his journey to Odessa. End of chapter 17 End of The Permanent Husband by Fyodor Dostoevsky Translated by Frederick Wishaw Recording by Lee Smalley